Hello and most welcome to 948 of the series and I will continue with Susie Froebel's book because it's, uh, I don't know, it feels very rewarding and it seems to be right up there in the right area. So this will be already 948 on the Heidegger. This is about human body, human movement, and how there is a synchronization in the endogenous and the exogenous brainwave slash body system. Isn't that rather interesting? Well, wait for the punchline and you'll be rather surprised. So this is page 89 of the book. Fractal time of Susie Froebel. Sorry for the. Sorry for the interruption here. A lot of people being very exciting, honking their horns. Chapter five. Contextualization, embedded observer participants. There was little agreement among ancient Greek philosophers about how we see external objects. Opinions were divided on whether and how we internalize the exterior or externalize the inferior interior. The atomists believe in the intromission theory. That is to say that for an object to be vis visible, its particle must come to the eye. Be it as atoms flowing in a continuous stream from the object into the eye, as Epicurus suggested, or as pressed air, which holds the object's colors, as proposed by Democritus. Euclid, by contrast, believed in the extremition theory, which holds that visual rays animate from the eye in the shape of a cone. The Platonic tradition defended a combination of intromission and extramission in which a stream of fire or light, which is emitted from the eye, fuses with the light of the sun. Aristotle accepted neither theory and argued that if rays animate from the eye, they should be visible in the dark. And the idea that objects shrink and enter the eye also seemed absurd to him. He came up with the idea that sunlight is reflected by objects and transmitted into the eye through a medium. With a few notable exceptions, this is roughly what most people believe today. A modern advocate of the theory that eyesight results from a combination of intromission and extramission is Max Wellmanns who maintains that, that when we perceive an object via light rays through the eye, it is turned into a neural representation by our brains. maintains that when we perceive an object via light rays through the eye, it is turned into neural representation by our brains and then projected outwards, thus creating phenomenal space. The question as to whether the perception is active, passive or a combination of both is not lim limited to the optical considerations. 
Rösler has posed the question of how we create the wallpaper in our brain, i.e. how do we generate a first-person perspective and a shared reality. We certainly do not just map the outside world like a camera obscura. You don't remember camera obscura? That's uh, the invention of Rinoleski in Florence. Not of a monad-like closed system with, as Leibniz put it, no windows to the outside world. We saw in chapter 4 that the world observer boundary can expand and contract depending on whether we assign parts of the environments to ourselves or vice versa. <coughs> These assignments conditions are decisive when it comes to our perception of the world because the resulting extended boundary forms our personal reality. The interplay of intermissions emissions from both the outside and from within us create interference patterns which form the wallpaper in our brains. This happens for instance when auto-acoustic emissions interfere with external sound waves. Auto-acoustic emissions are sound created by our inner ear. The cochlear which amplifies the external sounds increases its activity in the absence of external acoustic stimuli and thus generates auto-acoustic emissions. I think that would be especially interesting to Kalle Lundahl who I think recently studied your autobiography by Derrida. In general, intermission is everything that makes an impression on us from the outside, in the sense that it modifies our interfaces by generating information, that is to say, by making indentations. Such an impression can be limited to one sense, for instance, when we listen to music inside an isolation tank. That is a tank which is dark, soundproof, half filled with body temperature water and used to simulate sensory deprivation and all parentheses. Usually, however, we perceive the world around us via several senses simultaneously, which means that we perceive is an interference pattern. An example of such cross-modal interferences, that is to say, Two or more senses influencing with each other is speech perception. We detect sound waves. Not only through the air, but also via receptors in our skin, which regi register tiny bursts of aspiration produced by some speech sound sounds like pa and ta. Gick and Derek show that tactile information is integrated into auditory perception in much the same way as has been observed in the coupling of auditory visual stimuli. In the experiment, participants were exposed to inaudible air puffs on the hand and the neck and simultaneously to aspirated speech sounds. Subjects tended to hear all syllables coordinated with those air puff as aspirated. For instance, they would mishear B, hardly aspirated, as P, aspirated, if the sound was accompanied by a cutaneous air puff. The interference of external cross model stimuli suffice to distort the interpretation of the overall impression. Perceptual distortions 
result from interference among stimuli which reach us via our various sensory channels, as well as interference resulting from the interplay of internal and external dynamics. Those internal dynamics can cause extramissive interference patterns either by emitting, say, electromagnetic waves when our epidermis dissipates heat, or by a specific mindset which acts as a cognitive and perceptual filter. We should discuss examples of cognitive filters which turn into perceptual ones later in this chapter. In a nutshell, the extremisions which lead to such interference is manifest in what Weibel calls the noise of the observer. That's Weibel with a double U. <laughs> Following Rössler's observation that the world as it appears on our interfaces is always colored by the observer's internal microscopic movements. The Bible states that the observer's own signal or noise and that of his object become inextricably intertwined. A dilemma arises if the observer is not aware that he is an endo-observer and misinterprets his own noise as information about the situation under observation. This would happen in the case of total sensory deprivation. Weibel goes as far as saying that it is the noise of the observer which manufactures cultural consent, be it in science or religion. The point is that as observers we cannot rid ourselves of the interference our own internal noise causes. We are part of the interference pattern. This is from Weigel. The noise of classical communication theory is more or less the noise of one's own signal. Where the observer acts to correct errors, the noise in quantum physics is the noise of the observer, unavoidable and necessarily producing errors. Information is therefore unavoidable, unavoidably observer relative. Of necessity the observer creates noise. He can escape this noise of observation only by himself becoming a part of the information model. <laughs> A way of circumverting self-generated noise would be to take a step back and look at the system from the outside as a super-observer. In practice this is not achievable. Such as Laplace demon does not exist. Hofstadt to refer to this kind of level crossing in which internal and external perspective intertwine as strange loops or tangled hier hierarchies. A strange loop occurs when something within the system jumps out of it. And acts upon that system as if, if it were outside. By definition a strange loop can only be resolved by taking a step back onto the metal level. That is to say, by adding a dimension or introducing another degree of freedom into the system. For instance, an additional observer who is situated outside the tangled hierarchy. 
Having accepted that, by generating internal noise, we are part of the interference pattern. We must recognize that it is of minor importance whether the observer-generated noise is actually emitted into our closed environment, in parentheses, i.e. running a temperature and dissipating body heat, or remains below our epidermis, i.e. experiencing hunger, and of parentheses. As long as there is internal structural change, our interface reality will be affected by it just as much as by inter external impacts. This is a variation on Buskovich covariance effect we discussed in chapter 4. And although, as Rössler had pointed out, too much symmetry should make us suspicious. We are rarely aware of covariance as the structure of our own interfacing filters has become transparent to us. Babel is aware of our blindness when it comes to recognizing how covariance shapes our perspectives. So continue from Babel. Observation by an observer is therefore no longer sufficient to increase information. Rather, what is required is an increased correlation and covariance of observer and observations. It is questionable, however, whether we can grasp these correlations. End of sight. This very blindness is probably a selection effect. It is, all, it is also often a blessing in disguise, since it saves time and energy to avoid conscious filtering, as Metzinger's Wolf example shows. It is sufficient, he says, to represent the fact there's a wolf there, without having to add another bracket by nesting our precepts into the phenomenological interpretation. There is an active wolf representation in my brain now, yeah, it seems rather unnecessary. It is only when our expectations are not met or misattributions occur that it becomes useful to make visible the usually transparent internal structure of our perspective. To be compared to the famous doctors thinking about the cat, whether it exists or not, on a communal, local level, it's quite fair to say either it exists or not. Any other answer would be out of option. Wouldn't make any sense. The two-way interaction between the observer and the rest of the world generates the interference pattern we discern as reality. As social beings, most of us constantly seek out interaction with our environment, which includes other people. This interaction continuously modifies our world's self-boundary and creates what Moore refers to an ethereal skin of interference, a simultaneous interaction between extramission and intromission. Other impacts on the interference pattern which manifests itself as a reality of cognitive and perceptual filters induced by conditioned responses. And as our actions are goal-directed, these show themselves as, among other things, intentions, expectations and attentional focus. Attention, for instance, focuses and constrains our perspective it is a compelling example of how a cognitive filter can give rise to perceptual one. To see how 
this reveals itself. Let us look at the phenomena of change blindness. This occurs when someone fails to notice sometimes very large changes to objects or scenes in his environment. This failure can happen from one instance to the next. Simmons and Levin have shown that individuals who have been asked for directions by a pedestrian in the street often did not notice that that pedestrian was replaced by another one while the door was carried in front of the first one. And I can add that is also part of Just for Laughs. You can go into the internet and check it out. It's a French-Canadian comedy group that make uh, candid camera jokes and one that is very popular, this one. Now, if people know this is very common, maybe it wouldn't be as funny. But here the person changes completely, uh, turn into an old man from a young girl and vice versa. That doesn't really make change, but they conti continue the interaction. That shows what the filter is and what it does. With change blindness, failure to detect modifications from one moment to the next could be memory related, as successive impressions need to be connected. To avoid a possible bias caused by memory performance, another phenomena called attentional blindness is often presented as an even stronger constraint on our perception. In attentional blindness, all information is potentially available simultaneously. Uh, in parentheses, not successively, as in change blindness, provided we pay attention. It reveals that an event which happened in our environment is not perceived at all if we not focus on it. That is to say, if we don't give it our attention. A famous example is the gorilla-like being, actually a woman in a gorilla costume, who walked for a basketball game unnoticed but approximately half of the test subjects who watched the recording of it. As the game absorbed all their attention, anything unexpected became invisible to them. The experiment was repeated later in a slightly varied form, which with the image of a woman with an umbrella being superimposed on the screen. Here too, approximately half of the test group failed to notice the woman. Since Simmons and Chabris observed in their experiments that the du duration of an unexpected event that can be missed is surprisingly long. In the first experiment, the test group was shown a stimulus tape of 63 seconds, in nine of which the gorilla was visible. Walking from right to left in the basketball court, stopping in the middle, looking into the camera, thumping his chest and continuing to walk across the court. As we saw in the first chapter, a narrow focus can blot out not only visual stimuli, but any modality. The police officer failed to hear his colleagues' gunshots and found his field of vision greatly reduced because he focused on his potential target. But as the gorilla experiment shows, it does not need a stressful situation like a shootout to constrain our perception. We often perceive only those objects and details which receive focused attention, while un unanticipated objects and events can go unnoticed. Another cognitive filter which gives rise to perceptual constraints and distortion is what Ellen Langer calls mindlessness, a mental state in which we rely too rigidly on categories created in the past. Langer calls this condition entrapment by category. A 
imagine someone ringing your bell in the middle of the night offering you ten thousand dollars for a seven by three foot piece of wood you are standing in the open doorway wrecking your brain to think where you could obtain such a piece of wood quickly it seems an impossible task so you decline the offer reluctantly next day passing a construction site you see a seven by three foot piece of wood a door you could have just unhinged your door and exchanged it for a small fortune but your mindlessness hid the piece of wood from you because to you it was stuck in the category door door in citation mark the many causes of mindlessness range from automatic behavior a belief that resources are limited acting from a single perspective and constraints on linear time to the influence of context for all purposes the the two the last two courses are particular interest let us take a closer look at the notion of context the term is derived from the latin contextus meaning joining together from com equals together and texted to weave the verb contextere can be translated as weave together a sense relative to the notion of context in temporal perspectives here the notion implies that something new emerges from the interference namely the simultaneous and successive weaving together of several strands of strings these could be internal and external strings woven together into an extended boundary for instance autoacoustic emissions and external sounds the emergent structure could also result from the eternal interference as in cross modal perception when our brains molds visual and auditory stimuli into one event even if they arrive at different time times as in the perception of close by thunder and lightning alternatively external stimuli may interfere before they interact with the observer as do superimposed electromagnetic or sound waves for instance mobile phone headset can be cancelled out unwanted background music noise in planes or trains before it hits the ear of the speaker make it unnecessary for, for him to raise his voice however though his auto acoustic emissions the speaker does still interfere with the external interference pattern or waves which cancels out or reinforce each other the pattern which emerges is more than the sum of its part because the individual simultaneous strings which are woven into a new fabric creates create alpha delta depth no delta t depth and thus a temporal perspective and if you look at the wave rhythms cause temporal patterns whether by face locking eg clocks on a shelf that fall into uniform ticking rhythm or more complex temporal interface parents eg women shifting each other's menstrual cycles simultaneity in each case as sufficient condition for the existence of context in connection with temporal perspectives i shall henceforth use the term context to mean simultaneous structures or patterns including people which are arranged simultaneously in a temporal perspective in other words in delta t depth let's cut the noise and let's continue i say thank you very much and bye bye